Well, last Sunday, I confessed that I hate traffic. I don't know if you do, but as people were leaving uh, church, I, I was just saying to them, you know, instead of like, have a great week, I just said, enjoy the traffic. And uh, the very last person I saw as I was leaving was with their daughter, and they were holding the door open for me. And so I said, uh, enjoy the traffic. And she, having been a great student of the homily, said, I am the traffic, <laughs> which was something I'd said, which is true, right? Where's our awareness? We're always the problem. We're always going to be the problem. Well, I want to start by telling you something else I hate. I hate shaving. I think we start to think, Father's just using the homily to air his grievances lately. <laughs> so, <laughs> I hate shaving so much, and I hate every aspect of it. I hate the time it takes. I hate all the setup and all the prep. I hate how much they charge for razors. It's ridiculous. It is sinful. It is greed but I found a way around the system. It's a double-edged razor blade, right? You just buy those, they're cheap, they're like a penny a piece. You just have to buy the razor once and you put it in there, this is how my grandfather shaved, no problem. Anyone here done it? Yeah. Well, here's the problem for me. I bought it, I got it all set up, I get the good lather going. And the worst thing possible could happen. The first stroke went really well. You know where this is going, right? This is true in life. I teach this to students all the time. Sometimes the worst thing that can happen, I don't care if you're swinging a bat or doing a math equation or being kind to a stranger, sometimes the worst thing that can happen is the first time goes well. Because you can get the wrong answer in a math problem or you can get the right answer for the wrong reason that you didn't actually do the formula right, but sometimes you can get the right answer anyway and that can get you in huge trouble later. Sometimes you swing the bat incorrectly, but because the pitch is where it was, you hit it. You think, oh, that's it. No, it's not. And so my first stroke, you know, I watched a YouTube video. I'm all set. You know, hold it. You got to hold your skin tight. Short strokes, by the way. If you're going to try this, I want to save you from what happened to me. Ooh, that went really well. Let's go here. And I caught the edge of my nose with that really sharp blade and just shaved off about a, just a, just deep enough to, initially, it's it's always that moment if you've ever cut yourself like this. Is that going to bleed? It's not bleeding yet. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Luckily, Father Jeff owns a styptic pencil. Yeah, right. Now, now I'm getting old. Blot that. It hurts a little bit, but it stops the bleeding. What does this have to do with the gospel? Quite a bit. Thank you very much. And it fits this way. There are two poles that you and I have to work at, and that's what Jesus is driving at here. We all have a shadow self. It's the part of us that we'd rather not think about and in some ways denies exists, and we certainly don't want others to see it. We don't don't want to talk about that shadow self. It's it's what the prophets of old and what Jesus were, that's what seers do. They point it out, and it's both individual shadow and corporate shadow. So we can think of it as the shadow of our person or the shadow of our parish or the shadow of our church or our country. Insert corporate. What is the thing that we just don't want to talk about? And that's what prophets always poke at. But the problem for most of religion is that shadow, by the way, it's not an evil thing, the shadow self, but it is the thing that allows us to do evil and not call it evil. (laughs) It's the part of us that lets, well, that's not so bad. Sometimes people say in confession, well, I'm not that bad of a person. I haven't murdered anyone. Well, praise God, you know. (laughs) Let's just set the bar really low and see if we can leap over it. That's, oh, I'm not that bad. Or that's not that bad. At least I'm not as bad as Susie or Billy. You know, like, oh, here we go. All of that is symptom, and it never gets to the cause, Right? And so for me, as, the, as this person shaving wildly with this double-edged razor blade, if all I ever did was say, oop, there's another nick, and I just get out my styptic pencil, I'm just addressing the symptom of me being a poor shaver. I'm never getting at the cause, which is ultimately slow the heck down. That's the first requirement of this double-edged razor blade. You cannot, like a safety razor, just do 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 or you will, and I've got like three of them right now. But this morning, praise God, not a single nick. Thank you very much. (laughs) But it required me to keep going back and going, what am I doing wrong? Or, like I said, the alternative is just to keep buying more styptic pencils and blotting this thing all over my face and showing up to work with this little white powder all over me. 
And people are going, he's going to die. He can't keep doing this. <laughs> he can't keep doing this. But that's the shadow self. And people would look at us, right? That's the thing, whatever you want to call that. People in addiction call it denial. You know, when you confront someone, go, hey, man, your life's out of control. You've lost your job. You're about to lose your home. Everything's fine. Don't even look over there. Don't even look at that. And we all have it. It is our sin. And if our whole battle is trying to avoid fault, we'll never win. And on some level, the devil does a little dance because we are focused in the wrong place. And I'll prove it to you. Jesus is never, ever, ever upset with sinners. He is only ever, ever upset with hypocrites, those who think they're not sinning. Eleven times in Matthew's gospel does he take on hip hypocrisy. He hits it here, right? The beam and the splinter. What's that really about? Well, that's about not addressing the thing that's really important, which is the ego you get the shadow self and the ego. As I said, here's the two issues. We've got to get at the ego. We've got to be able to dismantle the false self. There's a lot of language for this. But if you just work on the shadow, you'll never surrender. You don't have to. And that's what the ego loves about it. Right? Oh, we'll just, we'll just work on the symptom. And then in our great, you know, capitalist Western mindset, it's, 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 we can measure it. We love to measure things. Bottom line, oh, I did, I did that sin 10 times last week. Now I'm dead at five. Ta-da! <laughs> and Jesus goes, oh, my goodness, you hypocrite. That's not even what it's about. You're fighting the wrong fight. This is not about avoidance. The cross is not about the avoidance of sin. It's, it's God, God's self saying, you're going to have to let go. You're going to have to let go if you want to receive this fully. There's no other way to do it. So we look at the shadow. We look at that, which, which we got to have the courage to let the prophets in our lives gently and lovingly reveal to us. But then we got to do the difficult work. And that's where this splinter beam analogy comes in. Because what we're usually the most upset about in others is ourselves, right? When we see it in someone else, that's what I'm saying. We've got to work on ourselves. That's our beam but we can be heightenedly aware to just the littlest bit of it, a splinter. And Jesus just saying so strongly, look, you have got to work on you. This is, connects so well to last Sunday. You know, I'm sitting in traffic. You are the traffic. <laughs> if you weren't there, you, there wouldn't be as much traffic as I said last Sunday. And so here we find ourselves listening to this message. If you and I want to bear good fruit, as it says at the end, then we better be people that understand the battle that we're in. I don't like the battle imagery. I never have. We're at war with this. Could it be any more relevant than it is right now in our world when we speak of the war on poverty or the war on drugs as if it was, it was a good thing that the Prince of Peace is trying to teach us another way, which is to gently surrender to his love. And his love will conquer it. As Paul says in Ephesians, when you shine light on the darkness, the darkness becomes light. It all starts to come together. The need for us to be people that can step into the light. It may hurt our eyes. It may reveal something we'd rather not see. But what we find is never condemnation. What we find is love and mercy and the power that conquers sin and death. And then we bring our faults. We can, we can lovingly step into that light. And then we give others permission to be the same. And when we start to get a little angry with someone else, can we stop and go, is that, is that just ego? What is that? Because then there's something more we can hand back to God. This is not easy stuff. But when we make it about something that it was never designed to be, we can be very busy and we'll be very proud of our accomplishment when in reality we're going to have to keep surrendering. And as I said, we'll see, we'll see the problem always where it lies, which is with our own brokenness. But when we, when we are strong, we give others permission to be strong. When we are the light, Marianne Williamson's most famous poem, right, about when, when we let our light shine, we give others permission to do the same. And when we are honest about our shadow and our ego, we give others permission to do the same. That's the value of our community. 
if we don't do that occasionally, we do it every mass in a very, uh, you know, kind of surfacey way. You know, I, I confess to God and to you, my brothers and sisters, I've sinned. And we say that, but I don't know if we ever stop to, like, what if we stopped the mass at that point and just turned to each other and said, let me share a couple with you. Ooh. <laughs> no, it's all right. That's why we have the sacrament, right? We have, a, we have a, a space where we can say that with complete trust that it's not going anywhere. But you and I both know too, right? Some of our most profound experiences of forgiveness don't happen in the sacrament. They happen one to another. When we're able to say to someone that has wronged us or we've wronged them, I'm sorry. And so that is why we start every liturgy that way. So that when we come to this Eucharist, his presence that we don't deserve, Jesus is well aware of our shadow. He's well aware of our ego. And by the way, last point, the ego can show up either way. Negatively as sort of self-hatred or, or positively as sort of self-inflation. It can show up either way. Jesus just saying, come. Come to me, not because you're worthy, but because you are faithful. Because you believe. And then and only then can his presence begin to change us. Not just to avoid sin, but to be the kind of people that holistically lay down our ego, lay down our non-negotiables or whatever we call them. This becomes a very powerful space. This is a very difficult thing to do. And many don't do it for many reasons. They either point at the hypocrisy of the church and then never come anymore, or they do come and make it solely about the shadow. And I hope we see the trap that that becomes. I tried to give you the silly image of that if, if I just keep shaving the same way, I will, you will not recognize me in a few months. I will have trimmed off so much. <laughs> it's a silly example, but it keeps, that's the thing about true. True just keeps pointing back to truth. And Jesus will offer him, us himself sacrificed, broken, poured out. As I said to you before, he could give himself to us any way he wants. It is not a coincidence that how he gives himself to us today is in a sacrifice, is broken and poured out so that we won't be afraid to crack ourselves open to see what honestly needs to be fixed and then to be lovingly poured out for others. Otherwise, if we're just taking in the Eucharist for ourselves like it was some spiritual vitamin, I can't imagine a more selfish act. But we take his presence within us so that we leave here sharing his presence with others. Not because we're perfect, we're well aware of our brokenness and our hypocrisy, but we do it with love and humility because our world needs it. There's a lot to be fearful of right now. My goodness, it can feel like, what is going on? And I'll tell you, I don't know. But what I do know is what I stand firm on today is his word and his sacrament. That that challenge fills me with, with some courage and some energy to go, yeah, let's do it, Jesus. And then immediately some fear to go, you do it, Jesus. <laughs> you do it. And he says, okay, let's start with the Eucharist. But I'm gonna ask you, I'm gonna ask you to step out and to share. I'm gonna ask you to pour yourselves out. And I say, okay. You did it for me. I'll do it for you and for all the beautiful people you've surrounded me with. Even those beautiful ones that drive me crazy and put me in traffic and taught me improperly how to shave. It, 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 insert the issue. Let's bring it to him. Let's take a moment in silence just to prepare ourselves to give it all to him before we receive him in this Eucharist. Again, not because everything that's in our hands is perfect. A lot of it is dark and shadowy and dirty. But that's the stuff he says, let me have that. I can fix that. I already have, quite frankly. But I can't fix it until you give it to me. Let's give it to him. May God be praised.